Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good afternoon, or maybe even good evening, depending on where you are. I'm Stefano Siviero. I'm one of the organizers of this webinar devoted to enhancing digital and global infrastructures in cross-border payments. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all to this two-day webinar, which I'm hearing my voice coming back. Um, and, and it's a two-day uh, seminar which is uh, organized in the context of Italy's presidency of the, of the G20. Um, I'm confident that we will have a lot of uh, food for thought at the end of these two days, during which we will benefit from the experience and knowledge and, and insights of a number of very distinguished uh, speakers. And let me take this opportunity to thank them all on behalf of the whole organizing committee. Uh, just for housekeeping topics, number one, today's webinar is being recorded and will be visible afterwards. In or number two, in order to minimize connection problems, your cameras and microphones should be turned off unless you're talking. Number three, you can ask uh, questions in the Q&A box uh, uh, during the various sessions and to open the Q&A box uh, click the three dots on the lower right uh, hand corner of your screen and number four and final uh, in chat uh, you should uh, be able to see the name of the person you should contact in case you have technical problems uh, so I'm done with housekeeping and I'm very pleased to leave the floor to Mr. Ignazio Visco governor of Banca d'Italia for his introductory remarks. And Governor Visco, please, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. Welcome to all the participants and panelists. I'm pleased to open this webinar on enhancing digital and global infrastructures in cross-border payments. This is a web web webinar which is organized by the Bank of Italy in the context of our G20 presidency initiatives. Its primary aim is to support activities that are being carried out within the G20 roadmap on the announcement of global cross-border payments, a roadmap that was published last October, about one year ago. And these activities have been indeed a top priority on the G20 agenda uh, over the last year, and we are committed to their advancement. Uh, this today discussion intends to take stock of the progress made in implementing the roadmap and gather views on the way forward from a variety of parties. 
They include policymakers, industry participants, and academics. The approaching end of the G20 Italian presidency is, uh, I think, the ideal time for a comprehensive checkup. Now, cross-border payments are considerably slower, more expensive, less transparent, and less accessible than domestic ones. To an extent, this reflects the large number of stakeholders involved and the need to encompass more than one single time zone, currency, jurisdiction, or regulatory framework. However, in recent years, international payments have become increasingly important for the world economy, reflecting the expansion of international trade, uh, notwithstanding the effects of COVID, of course, and especially e-commerce of international tourism, even if it is still uh, trying to get out from uh, the effects of the pandemic, and business travel of migration and remittances. Progress in cross-border payments is thus more necessary than ever. The improvement of cross-border payments has been at the top of the international agenda for many years. Consider, for example, the action plan launched by the Financial Stability Board in 2015 to assess and address the decline in correspondent banking, the 2015 targets on remittances set by the United States Nations as part of the Sustainable Development uh, Goals, uh, and uh, all the work that has been carried out by the BIS uh, within the C C C C CPMI, the Committee on uh, payments and market infrastructure, work which has dealt with correspondent banking, cross-border retail payments, and so on. But now, despite all these initiatives, the efficiency of cross-border transactions, however, has actually worsened in recent years compared to domestic payments, where the improvements have been enormous, reflecting in particular the introduction of fast payments in several jurisdictions. Only cross-border payments between highly integrated regional areas or within monetary unions seem to have benefited so far from the major advantages offered by digital innovation and in particular by the supply of fast payment services. Against this background, in 2020, the G20 Saudi Arabian presidency launched an ambitious and challenging plan to enhance cross-border payments at the global level and mandated the FSB to develop a roadmap, which was eventually published last October. Given the complexity of the challenge, the roadmap is necessarily a multi-annual project and will require progress to be made on many separate yet often interdependent fronts. The work plan has been structured around 19 pillars or building blocks aimed at paving the way for a favorable global payments ecosystem, taking into consideration a very broad range of legal, regulatory and operational issues. This year, under the G20 Italian presidency, substantial progress has been achieved by the groups responsible for these building blocks, despite the difficulties caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Possibly the most substantial progress has been that of setting out specific quantitative targets for the cost, speed, transparency, and accessibility of global cross-border payments. These targets aim to build a shared commitment to a common vision and to obtain specific outcomes which will form the basis of actions that will need to be carried out in the future. They were the focus of a public consultation that ended in July. And now work is well underway in taking on board the feedback from this public consultation and in drafting the final recommendations that, that will be published next month. Tomorrow's roundtable will take stock of the progress in implementing the roadmap and discuss the main challenges ahead. The G20 roadmap, in fact, encompasses a wide set of initiatives. They cover legal, regulatory, and operational issues. With respect to the latter, there are two main focus areas that have been identified. The first is devoted to improving existing payment infrastructures and arrangements by strengthening the existing links or building new ones between the various payment systems and reducing settlement risks. The second covers emerging payments infrastructures and explores the potential of new 
multilateral platforms, global state coin arrangements, and central bank digital currencies. The first solution consists in interlinking existing payment systems. It would represent a fast, almost readily available way to improve the efficiency of cross-border payments. Its viability is already demonstrated by a number of thriving initiatives. A recent experiment carried out by the Arab Regional Payments Clearing and Settlement Organization and the Bank of Italy consists on, of interoperating TIPS, the Eurosystem platform for instant payments, and BUNA, the cross-border and multi-currency instant payment system owned by the Arab Monetary Fund. It will be illustrated tomorrow in the session on payments without frontiers, leveraging existing infrastructures. Interlinking existing systems is arguably today the most attractive solution for several reasons. The jurisdictions engaged in the interlinking may continue to process payments according to their own legacy standards. Costly migration to common messaging and data most ready for use as is, as it can be implemented within a reasonable time frame and at a relatively limited cost. At the very least, it may be adopted to significantly improve the efficiency of cross-border payments in the immediate future, while new, potentially more efficient solutions are being developed. If, when we turn to the new solutions, those which aim at the building a comprehensive multilateral platforms, we have to understand that these solutions have the potential of exploiting economies of scale, and at least in highly integrated regions, are likely to represent the natural evolution of interlinking arrangements among existing systems. While potentially attractive, new multilateral platforms may still raise a number of challenges and risks which are likely to be magnified when moving from regional platforms to a larger, possibly global scale. These challenges and risks include the need of reaching consensus among a wide range of stakeholders, the complexity of government arrangements, and the concentration of operational and cyber risks. At the same time, the increasing digitalization of our economies, including the development and potential introduction of CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies, offers large potential opportunities, uh, opportunities that have yet to be fully explored. These risks and opportunities will be considered later today in the panel session on new payments infrastructures and in the session that will follow, which will take a closer look at some operational facets of two new technologies, namely distributed ledgers and uh, CBDCs. Whatever the technical solutions may be, it is essential that the public and private sector cooperate closely. Indeed, the quality of the service offered to the end users depends crucially on such cooperation. Reaching the optimal balance between public intervention and private initiative is not trivial and raises a number of sensitive issues. We could ask, for example, whether central banks and other public authorities should limit themselves to promoting a gradual convergence towards new legal, regulatory, and technical standards, or whether they should take a more central role as developers and operators, so as to deal with potential market failures and neglected, neglected collective needs. The panel session on enhancing cross-border payments, public-private interaction, will cover the, these uh, as well as uh, other related issues. We are all very well aware that several challenges have to be successfully addressed in order to deliver the ambitious goal of the goals of the G20 roadmap. I'm sure that this webinar will cast light on a number of them, but it will only be a single step on a long and winding road. Other initiatives will need to be carried out before truly positive results are to be obtained. In this vein, the Bank of Italy will soon host another webinar co-organized with the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which will focus on the challenges and the anticipated benefits of interlinking existing payment systems that already allow the processing of fast, of fast payments. This webinar will take place on the 22nd of November 
and it goes without saying that all of you will be invited. To conclude, let me thank the organizing committee for putting together such a rich and interesting program and welcome uh, the panelists, presenters, discussants and all the other participants. I'm confident that even though we cannot meet in person in these uh, continually difficult time, the discussions of these two days will, uh, will certainly uh, provide uh, a lot of opportunities and uh, will, uh, I think, uh, be intense, uh, thought-provoking, and will, be, will deliver new and uh, insightful uh, new, new approaches. I, I am now pleased uh, to leave uh, the virtual floor to the Managing Director of the MF, Kristalina Georgieva, to whom, uh, Kristalina, I see you there, I wish to express my special thanks for being with us today and sharing your thoughts and insights on this most uh, crucial issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, much Ignacio. Uh, great uh, introductory uh, points. Uh, they set the stage really well. Uh, and let me say how delighted I am to be speaking to you today. Though it is a pity I cannot join you in the beautiful city of Rome. I would have liked to applaud the Italian presidency of the G20 in person for your accomplishments over the last year and for moving this very important agenda uh, that we are discussing today forward. And I would have liked to stroll through the street, streets of a city I love. In Rome, one is constantly reminded of history. Layer over layer, civilizations have left their mark and beneath, quite literally, we find an architectural miracle. The aqueducts, the pipes, the sewers built by Roman engineers nearly 2000 years ago to provide modern living standards to a city of uh, over 1 million people. So what is it? A plumbing system that continues to be used, hidden yet so essential. Uh, and today I will speak about another form of hidden infrastructure, just as essential, the plumbing of modern payment systems. Unlike those of ancient Rome, uh, today's cross-border payment pipes will not last for anything close to another 2,000 years. Uh, in fact, if you are to be honest, these pipes need an urgent upgrade now. As most people know, cross-border payments today are often slow, expensive, opaque, cumbersome, and for some people, inaccessible. Those who need them the most, the poor, are worst affected. But we have good news, and you actually touched upon it. We have technology that is ushering a new era of innovation in payments. And the international community is coming together to help ensure we can all benefit from this innovation. New technology will shape more than just money and payments. Uh, financial systems more broadly uh, are already affected, will be more affected with implications for macrofinancial stability, monetary policy, growth, uh, and the international monetary system. What we see at the fund is an incredible jump in demand by our membership for advice on these matters. Uh, just to let you know, several dozen uh, countries just in the last six months alone came to ask the fund to give them a helping hand. Why? because cross-border payments bring both opportunity and they bring risks. So you want to, to capture the opportunities, but we do need to be concerned about the risks. The promise of new technologies will prevail over the potential peril if we get three things right. First, cooperation around technology and design choices. Second, a strong enabling environment comprising incentives for private sector participation, as well as solid regulatory, legal, and data frameworks. 
and third, a focus on macrofinancial stability. So let me uh, start with the first priority, fixing the pipes. It is key to do it through coordination. Uh, Cross-border payments can only be as efficient as the weakest link. And we have to recognize that we must fix all major hurdles at once and ensure that solutions are interoperable between countries. The alternative, a piecemeal rollout that would frustrate businesses and consumers is really not a good alternative. And it is so fortunate that the G20 roadmap sets out the key challenges associated with, with cross-border payments and it describes the essential elements of a response. And I cannot emphasize enough the importance that countries stay in lockstep with the guidance of this roadmap. And obviously we at the fund will do our part for it. Uh, it is appropriately broad. It will soon include clear targets for accountability and it provides a framework for more ambitious solutions such as directly linking existing payment systems across borders. Uh, you mentioned uh, Singapore. Let me bring another Singapore uh, story. Singapore and Thailand, for instance, have successfully linked their payment systems. So today, a worker in Singapore can send money to their family in Thailand within minutes, just using a mobile phone number. Before, it could take two days. Other solutions are even more forward-looking. Imagine, for example, a virtual marketplace where payment providers across countries can meet to transact according to common rules and procedures and a common technical infrastructure. Or a platform that allows households and firms to send central bank digital currencies directly to each other immediately without going through multiple costly intermediaries. Uh, and here I want to acknowledge the tremendous work done by, by the BIS Innovation Hub. It's fantastic that they have taken this topic early and are running with it. Uh, and the members uh, of this Innovation uh, Hub are pushing boundaries in testing novel solutions. Let me get to the second uh, point, strengthening the enabling environment. We can be carried away by technology easily by the illusion that technology will solve all problems. But technology does not exist in isolation. And this is why the second priority is to improve the enabling environment that will accelerate the adoption of new payment systems while guarding against fraud and errors. Uh, what it means is coordinating on clear legal regulatory and data frameworks, and I'm stressing all three are necessary, and developing the appropriate incentives for the private sector to bridge the gap to end users. Uh, we have an interesting uh, story, the Southern African, uh, African Development Communities Regional Payment Systems. They show the power of getting incentives right. Uh, a peer pioneer in uh, 2013, SADC began with three countries and faced initial skepticism from some correspondent banks. Their response? They adjusted the proposition by lowering costs, improving transparency, and allowing simple connectivity. This insensitized banks to sign up, and the platform now includes 74 commercial banks and eight central banks across 15 countries. On the leg uh, legal and regulatory side, uh, standard setting bodies have already done important work, often collaborating with the IMF and other international organizations. This includes recommendations on anti-money laundering, uh, on regulation of virtual asset service providers, stable coins, and even CBDC, all of which may be using cross-border payments. But guidance is not always enough and many countries also need assistance with implementation and so on how can we do that and here the imf's capacity development work is helping policymakers on the ground and our broad membership means we can act as a transmission line of good practices from one country to another uh, 
An example is the Pacific Island countries, where we are working with the authorities to strengthen their uh, ML uh, uh, CFT frameworks uh, to facilitate cross-border payments and remittances uh, flows. So we deal with anti-money laundering, we deal with the risk uh, uh, of bad people doing bad things, because if we don't, then we undermine the credibility of what uh, we are um, uh, envisaging for the future. Uh, I mentioned data. I think uh, you, you would be the first, uh, Ignacio, to recognize that the data front is essential. As digital money gets transferred across borders, so too does data. A more and more viable and valuable commodity that deserves just as much attention as transfers of money. Cooperation will be key to ensure that data crossing borders can be trusted, accessed, stored properly while adhering to national privacy standards. So progress on all these fronts, incentives, legal, regulatory data is essential. So the beautiful pipes linking payment system systems uh, will not run dry. So we have pipes, but nothing happens. Uh, let me go to the, the uh, further uh, step uh, uh, on that uh, topic and uh, kind of back from the pipes. Uh, there is a, a potential uh, tension between open uh, the, the uh, um, open uh, data and uh, uh, and uh, the interoperability that would be necessary for cross-border payments. So we have a technical objective to ensure this in interoperable payments, but then we also have countries' policy objectives to manage capital flows, to limit volatility, and retain control over monetary policy and exchange rate regimes. And that is where as I mentioned in the beginning, we have a third priority for policymakers to promote macrofinancial stability while implementing the new generation of cross-border payments. Vast po uh, topic, uh, and I will just dwell on, on two points. The frictionless transfer of money could lead to currency substitution, something that uh, uh, you, Ignacio, have, have been uh, bringing up too in, in meetings. The, the widespread use of a foreign currency to save and to transact, and in turn, countries would lose control of domestic monetary and financial conditions. Authorities cannot set interest rates or lend in large quantities in foreign currency. Today, countries are protected from currency substitution by sound policies and institutions that underpin trust in the domestic currency, but they're also protected, let's face it, by frictions. It is costly and cumbersome to hold and transact foreign currency. As money becomes digital, these frictions dwindle. And questions arise. Might countries need to limit the circulation of foreign currency on their territories to maintain policy interdependence? If so, how? Will the international community cooperate to design central bank digital currencies and regulate privately issued forms of money? And will we be able to avoid erecting walls that contravene the flow of capital for investment and hedging purposes? So very delicate uh, uh, questions, uh, which the IMF will help tackle given our mandate to preserve economic and financial stability, as well as the stability of the international system. Uh, and we have another job, it is less glitzy, but just as important to promote stability, which is to help promote financial inclusion and avoid a digital divide. Uh, as some countries or regions make great strides in leveraging technology to improve cross-border payments, others may not. We may struggle to adopt, to regulate, to integrate, to evaluate the good offers from the and then separate them from the bed. Uh, but if, if we have that uh, divergence, we can see fragmentation and inequality rising. Should not happen under 
our watch should not happen under the uh, uh, G20 watch, the IMF watch. We should do everything in our power to help each of the countries stay abreast of developments to capture the promise and avoid the peril. And we can do more. We can represent these countries in fora like the G20. The IMF uh, has done that traditionally, that fosters cooperation on principles, standards, solutions, ensure that the voices, the concerns, the policy objectives of all countries are heard. So let me let me let me conclude. You have done a fabulous job to put the uh, principle of cooperation at the heart of your G20 presidency. It is the same principle that is a cornerstone of the fund's new strategy on digital money. So I so strongly believe that together we must put cooperation at the heart of efforts to simultaneously address the three interconnected priorities, fix the pipes, strengthen the enabling environment, deal with macrofinancial implications. Uh, and I want to finish with the Roman Emperor, since uh, I cannot be in Rome, but I would have liked to be. Uh, Marcus Aurelius said, we are born for cooperation, as are the hands, the feet, the eyelids, and the upper and lower jaws. Let's continue on this path operate thank you very much uh, thank you very much Cristalina. thank you 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 really covered a lot of ground we will certainly follow what the mf does with all the other um, institutions which really are very much engaged in this cooperative effort i think we are also have to be on one side realistic so we have to be fast in trying to find the solutions which are manageable and uh, obtain the results that we all expect. And at the same time, we have to work uh, to have this new infrastructure tested and uh, as much as possible being linked uh, uh, one to the other. But uh, on financial inclusion that you mentioned, we obviously have also that very much in our uh, among our objectives in this G20 presidency. There will be uh, soon a meeting of the partnership for global in, for financial inclusion this global partnership is is an important component of g20 agenda and uh, a number of the issues that we mentioned will be treated there including how to avoid the, the digital divide increases rather than reducing there are a lot of opportunities coming from digital but uh, there are also many risks there is a problem of financial education and so on and we all these will be covered also also there and then we will talk a little bit about this also in washington at the g20 meeting so thank you Kristalina. i give the floor back to stefano stefano please okay let me thank governor visco and managing director georgieva for sharing with us uh, their 360 degrees overview of the issues on the table and for uh, you know, uh, pointing out all the reasons why this issue we are discussing today and tomorrow is so relevant and what the main challenges ahead uh, are. Let me now give the floor to Fabio Panetta, member of the Governing Council of the ECB, who will chair the, today's uh, panel session, which is entitled the New Payment Infrastructures. So, Fabio, uh, the floor is yours. Uh Thank you, Stefano, and uh, good afternoon and good morning to everybody. Uh, good afternoon, Governor Visco. Good afternoon. Good morning, uh, Managing Director Georgieva. Well, first of all, let me thank my friends and former colleagues at Banca d'Italia for inviting me to chair this panel uh, today on new payments infrastructures, a, a, a burning issue. Uh, on this, I know that it has been said several times, but nonetheless, I will say it again. We are living through exciting times in the payment space. We know it, but uh, it's good to repeat. Given that uh, uh, Managing Director Georgieva uh, uh, mentioned a Roman emperor, let me uh, mention a, a Roman say, repetita human. So let me say that again. We are in a, 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 a truly revolutionary phase. Digitalization and innovation are coming together to advance wholesale and retail payment infrastructures and payment services. Uh, in retail payments, uh, new uh, 
players are emerging in the form of uh, uh, big tech firms who are in a position to leverage their huge customer base to expand into payments at a global level. Stablecoin initiatives are another emerging phenomenon with the potential to expand significantly across borders. This raises challenges for authorities which need to ensure that the regulatory oversight and supervisory frameworks uh, can address these instruments. And then, of course, we have central bank digital currencies, uh, where a huge amount of effort and thinking is being embarked on in the wholesale and uh, uh, also, especially, I should say, in the retail space. I'm sure that you are all aware that the governing council of the European Central Bank has recently decided to start what we call an investigation phase of a digital euro project that is a phase that will uh, keep us uh, busy well very busy i'm afraid for uh, the next two years uh, as we heard from governor visco uh, the cross-border dimension of payments has also become more and more relevant enhancing cross-border payments has been prioritized by the g20 and underpinned by a detailed multi-year roadmap so these are just a few of the topics that we will address during uh, today's panel session, guided by our panelists. I am delighted and privileged to introduce our four esteemed panelists. Let me start by welcoming, first of all, Barry Eichengreen, a professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley, Long Chen, director at the Luohan Academy, Academy, the Open Think Tank of Alibaba, Benedict Norens, head of the BIS Innovation Hub Center in Hong Kong, and last but by no means least, Marius Jurgilas, member of the board of the Central Bank of Lithuania. Uh, before I turn to the panelists, let me remind our audience uh, that we will also have the possibility to take uh, your questions through the chat function of the WebEx platform. Uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Fiona Van Eckelpel, has kindly accepted to monitor what is coming through because I cannot see the chat from here. That's also due to aging. And she will find uh, a way to bring your questions forward at an appropriate uh, moment. On the panel, I will now turn to the uh, panelists uh, and I would just uh, like to flag some questions that they might want to address. First of all, and drawing also on the introduction by Governor Visco and Managing Director Georgieva, which challenges can we expect to arise from new digital payment instruments, including CBDCs and privately issued stablecoins? Second, how is the increased prominence of technological companies in payments shaping market dynamics and user demand? Third, how can we preserve financial stability through risk proportionate regulation, oversight, and supervision. And finally, will CBDC fundamentally change cross-border payments? And if yes, in which directions? Our uh, panelists are uh, prominent figures in the debate on these topics. In the panel, uh, uh, my dear friend from the uh, panel, you should feel free to react to whatever other panelists may have said previously. You will have up to 10 minutes each before uh, uh, opening the Q&A session. Uh, to start, let me give the floor to Barry, followed by Benedict Long, Marius. Barry, over to you. Fabi, it's Fiona here. In fact, we seem to have a problem connecting with Barry. So, if you want to move to one of the other panelists uh, while we work uh, on that. Thank you, Fiona. So, maybe we can start with Benedict and then we uh, get back to, to Barry. Benedict, can, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, but uh, I, I will need uh, access to the sharing for the slides because I can't uh, share right now. So the organizer needs to let me share the content. Okay, I'm okay. sure it is now coming. Yep. I just need to. We can see them, but they're not full screen. Yep. Yeah. I think we're there. <laughs> I think we managed. Okay, good. So I'll not uh, cover the disclaimer on the front cover, but uh, these are these are my views, and they may or may not be the views of the of the BIS. 
So to start off first, uh, as, as you rightfully introduced, I'm the head of the Hong Kong uh, Center of the BIS Innovation Hub. And I, I think for most of you, you may know we're actually the latest or the youngest uh, addition to the BIS, um, to the BIS in general. And so you can see right now we have four centers, one in Switzerland with Morton Beck, myself in Hong Kong, Andrew in Singapore, and Per in a partnership with the New York Fed, which is the latest uh, extension. And our leaders obviously are uh, Benoit Curé and assisted by um, Ross Leckhoff. So what we do is we try to be really transparent from day one. So we created a website that is publicly accessible on which we show our six areas of focus uh, and CBDC being the principal one I will, I will focus on for, for this talk. Um, as I also included in this slide, as Agustin Carson said, money is one of humanity's greatest inventions. It enables you to specialize in one profession instead of having to do everything yourself or go through all the fuss of bartering goods. It brings the best out of every individual according to individual capabilities. Money is so to say the oil that makes our machinery work. And you could say that makes our lives work. The quest uh, for CBDC accordingly is a difficult one and an important one for all the reasons set out by the two previous uh, speakers. This slide, I will focus on cross-border wholesale CBDC, and in particular, I will focus on a project of the Hong Kong Innovation Hub, which is the so-called Embridge, and thus you see these bridge themes coming through my presentation. In sum, as we all know, um, Building Block 19 says to factor an international dimension into CBDC designs. And the Innovation Hub has consequently embarked on doing that in a number of his projects, of which the Embridge is one. The problem statement, as noted by prior speakers, is not only the absence of, not only the fact that correspondent banking is expensive, but also, in addition to that, that there is a retreat of the correspondent banks uh, globally. This retreat has been covered in research by the BIS, the IMF, and the World Bank. And the consequence of it, of it, of the consequence of it is that you could say certain countries are actually starting to face financial exclusion. Quest for CBDC, therefore, and for wholesale CBDC, is whether the creation of new bridges, um, and we call ours the M bridge, where different central banks participate on one platform to issue and redeem their CBDC, to speed up payments from days to seconds, and to reduce the cost, whether such is feasible. For this project, the Embridge, we are joined by the Bank of Thailand, the HKMA, um, the DCI of the PBC, of the People's, uh, People's Bank of China, as well as the Central Bank of the UAE. The Embridge is a so-called Model 3 platform, as set out in the research of, of um, Raphael Auer. It is a single MCBDC multi-currency system However, over time, it will need to accommodate to also be Model 2, an arrangement based on interlinked CBD systems. To, to make things very, very simple, we included these uh, pictures. One shows you the picture with correspondent banks. And as you can see, if you compare the two pictures, there is a correspondent bank on one side of this slide and not on the other. In addition to that, you see the creation of crossroads, which means that we can connect multiple parties on one platform with less intermediaries and therefore faster outcomes. The Enbridge project started its life as Intanon Lion Rock between the HKMA and the Bank of Thailand. It has now evolved as said to include the BBC DCI, as well as the Central Bank of the UAE. And our objectives are very much as was explained by the prior speakers. 
is to see whether this or original architecture can actually be scaled into something that can come closer to a live stage to make what we know is technologically feasible to actually make it into a reality. In terms of the current stage of the project, the prototype demonstrates a substantial improvement in cross-border transfer speed from multiple days to seconds, as well as the potential to reduce several of the core cost components of correspondent banking. It thereby demonstrates the potential of faster and lower cost cross-border transfers for the participating jurisdictions. Our future roadmap, as also highlighted by the prior speakers, cannot just be limited to technology, although the technology requires also further work and further improvement, but it must also include focus on policy, legal, and the business roadmap. Therefore, our priorities include system requirements necessary to safeguard monetary and financial stability, features to achieve compliance with jurisdiction-specific regulations and reporting requirements, legal governance of the platform and designing contractual arrangements for it, participation models and onboarding criteria for new central banks and participants, inclusion of non-bank players, associated roles and the scope of their permissible activities, and finally, the trials of business use cases with participating banks. Some something like the Embridge seeks to bridge markets for cross-border transfers. To do so while increasing the speed to seconds from previously days, and while also reducing the cost, Embridge involves minting and burning of wholesale CBDC of the participating jurisdictions. Embridge, if successful, presents an opportunity for markets that currently do not benefit from a strong correspondent banking infrastructure. We invite interested central banks to contact us to participate in this project, because as previously said, this is a, a very complex matter and B, we will only proceed. We will only jointly succeed if we cooperate. Let me close by saying that, as I mentioned, this is only one of the many projects of the BIS Innovation Hub to take forward the G20 agenda. We also have a project called Helvetia and an extension of it called Jura, which are run out of the Swiss Center. In addition to that, we have a project called Dunbar, run out of, out of the Singapore Center. And finally, we have one more project in the Hong Kong Center, which takes forward retail CBDC, in particular, a two-tier distribution model for retail CBDC. This would be my, uh, my closing statement, and thank you very much for giving me the stage. Thank you, Benedict. I see that Barry is connected. Barry, if you agree, I will give you the floor. Welcome. Thank you, Fabio. I um, apologize for the technical difficulties. You would think by now, uh, a year and a half into the pandemic, uh, I would have mastered all the relevant platforms, but uh, it, it is not the case. Uh, my presentation is going to be uh, uh, lower tech than what I've just seen, and I suffer from only having listened to the, uh, been able to hear the very end of Benedict Nolan's uh, presentation, which touches on some of the same issues uh, that I will touch on, but I uh, am here to be provocative and take the other side of the argument. So I'm going to uh, essentially argue two things. Number one, that these uh, pilot projects trying to link uh, national CBDC platforms and uh, alternative designs that are in, in, intended to integrate them on a single blockchain are very, very far from practical implementation. And that this is uh, 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 the, the opposite of usual economics. Usual economics is to show that uh, what works in practice can work in theory. Here, here, I think we have the opposite problem that we can show how these bridges uh, our, our work in theory, but getting them to work in practice, specifically from the point of view of governance, who is going to oversee uh, the operation of these 
platforms. That's going to be a very hard nut to crack. And secondly, I'm, I, I'm going to argue that uh, there are so many private initiatives ongoing in the cross-border payment sphere that the need for central banks to solve this problem is far from obvious. Uh, this may simply be a, a, a case where we can leave it to the private sector to bring down the current high costs of cross-border transactions. So uh, on, on the first point, I, I have been uh, reading the documentation, for example, of Ithanon and Line Rock and 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 uh, Benedict sh should correct me if I get it wrong. Whether the Embridge linking the two is uh, likely to be not not only workable in theory but also workable in practice. And it seems to me that the uh, the the practice is the hard part. So minting and burning national CBDCs sounds uh, like a, 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 a mechanical process, but someone, a licensed dealer, a commercial bank is gonna have to sit in the middle holding inventories of the um, relevant depository receipts into which those national CBDCs are, are, are gonna be converted when uh, uh, they are burned and minted respectively who, who exactly are these uh, uh, designated uh, dealers going to be? Are, are, are they going to be the commercial bank about who we just heard? Who is going to uh, uh, be sure that uh, uh, they are, they are, um, their inventories are adequate? Who is going to decide who is licensed in, in, in this domain uh, and, and, and not? So I think, um, it, this is a complicated question for two central banks to agree on, but uh, uh, a, a, a very detailed arrangement involving two central banks is not going to solve the globe's uh, cross-border payments problem. So I applaud the Bank of Thailand and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority for, uh, and, and, and their efforts to um, uh, explore these problems. And I, I applaud the BIS's uh, encouragement for other central banks to in, uh, join their design. But are 180 central banks globally going to be able to agree on who the designated dealers are, uh, what adequate inventories are, who is going to uh, uh, provide oversight of this arrangement? I think the resulting arrangements would be more complicated than the governance arrangements to which the International Monetary Fund and the World Trade Organization are uh, uh, answerable. And I, I, I think the design details of a single blockchain on which multiple CBDCs would, uh, would, would circulate would be more complex still. Who would design that blockchain? Uh, uh, would it be permissioned? Would it, uh, uh, what would the, uh, uh, permissions for the different uh, players entail. This would be, uh, a, again, I think a very complicated design. It would be surprising to me if it were actually implemented as opposed to uh, uh, modeled at the pilot stage in our lifetimes. In terms of the, um, uh, the private sector uh, an initiatives, I think the relevant question to ask is how much by how much would a set of linked CBDCs uh, uh, actually bring bring down costs and speed transactions relative to say Swift Go, which Swift has now the electronic system with uh, application interfaces to speed tran transactions to the point where they can be done in a couple of seconds. As, a, uh, as opposed to a couple of days, what is the ad, ad, ad advantage of interlinked CBDCs relative to a system in, in, in which we can all already do transactions or wholesale um, transactions can already be done 
virtually in real time uh, uh, across borders. With linked uh, CBDC platforms, it would still be necessary to pre-validate or ex post verify the identity of the customer account at the recipient bank. It would still be necessary to engage in services, uh, the services of an authorized dealer, as I've said, to complete the foreign exchange uh, depository receipt for depository receipt transaction. So one can, can imagine automating that last part of the process uh, using automated uh, market making and automated liquidity management technology uh, for the foreign exchange transaction. But uh, while, while those technologies exist, they haven't been implemented. They haven't been stress tested. And, and again, it's not obvious why uh, if and when those technologies are proven, they can't be adopted uh, equally by SWIFT and other non-distributed ledger-based uh, payment services. Um, so uh, let me stop there. I think um, th th there's definitely uh, an, an age enthusiasm gradient around these digital initiatives, and I think that may, may apply to CBDC as well. So as one of the older participants in, in this panel, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, I'm on the skeptical side. Thank you, Barry, for this uh, interesting and for central bankers provocative view, very interesting. I uh, would now give the floor to Long. Uh, Long, we cannot hear you. Maybe I can shift to Marius and maybe our colleagues on the organizational side can check if the connection of Long. Let me be... try that. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. You have the floor. Thank you. I could hear you. I cannot hear you anymore. Oh, my boy. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Don't touch anything now. Can I continue? Can I continue? Yes. Please go ahead. Yes. Yes. Cool. Okay. So, uh, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, important meeting. And I also would like to start by expressing my gratitude toward Italy. Uh, my honeymoon was spent in Italy and uh, back in 1999. Uh, to, uh, actually, and then after uh, 20 years, then I went back to Rome again. So it was great time. So I really love Italy. Now, I guess that today's topic, we're trying to discuss digital currency and payment. And as, as some of the previous guests have discussed, this is a very big and complex matter. And uh, to me, payment is both an important infrastructure of financial system as well as an essential part of economic activity. So essentially, it comes down to the relation between the regulators and the market. So I would like to uh, break this down to two parts to, to share my experience and views, and uh, hopefully some fruits for thoughts. And and let me emphasize that this only represents my own views. Now, let me first start with the first question. So I'd like to share a little bit evidence on what happened to payment in the digital era. Now, as we all know that like other parts of financial services, asymmetric information is the cause of the lack of scalability. So starting from the credit cards, that is the efforts to replace the cash payment, the arrangements are done to make card issuance and acceptance scalable. To achieve that, you have, you have to have certain infrastructures such as the post machine. Now they, we move to, to, to the digitization of the information. 
and which makes information extremely affordable to ident identify and verifiable. So for example, in China, QR code payment is a, is a very typical example because it's, it, it has become a little but important engine that transformed the landscape of payment and becomes a new payment infrastructure in China. In a, on top of that, it enables new business models. But let me stop, let me explain a little bit more. So back in 2011, uh, China started to try, it's by the private sector. Uh, back actually, it is starting from my city right now in Hangzhou. It started, it becomes the first mover in the world to introduce QR codes technology into the niche of mobile payments. And at that time, a typical post machine in China, a post machine in China could cost around $300 to $450. And the card processing fee was kind of several percent. Now, but because QR code is, you know, it's just a code extremely cheap. Merchants then they started to kind of uh, print out the QR code. Even the beggars started to use it. So that dramatically, because of the information revolution, that dramatically reduced the cost, as Barry mentioned, re reduced essentially the cost of the uh, accept accepting the payments down to essentially zero. So that becomes the really less to the boom of the of the uh, of the mobile payment in China and uh, interestingly it actually also defeated the use of the NFC payment because that's too costly and more complicated and the QR code is simple but it's it's secure enough that there's very little the 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 the, the fraud loss rate was like uh, one out of millions you know so it's uh, it's very uh, it has everybody can use it now then but Payment is not just payment. On top of that, it's not just the inclusion of payment. On top of that, we know that the fintech start have the loans because of digitized information. But that were already familiar. But another interesting thing is that it also enables a whole list of the uh, business model innovations. For example, the, the sharing uh, economy. Now, because you have the mobile payment, now you don't need to have, and it's secure, you don't need to have the uh, service provide provided on the spot. So for example, sharing bicycles, you know, everybody can use the QR code to open up the, 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 the bicycle that started to run. So my point here is that this not only, so I have two points here. The first is that the information revolution is changing how finance in particular payment is done. And, and it's relation with the real economy. So it, it Bring the cost essentially to zero, and it's much more integrated with the real economy, and it's, it's also spurs more business innovations. So, so, therefore, I think in order to leverage on the strengths of the digital technology, we have to leave some room for business operations. That's my first point. The second point is that if we think about this, how because of the information revolution, if we think about the current uh, uh, the arrangement of some of infrastructure like the of the uh, 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 of the credit cards, uh, it, it's trying to uh, con, uh, uh, trying to, uh, to 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 make, to have the uh, safety control. But because of how the information revolution, you can see that uh, there's a lot more information. We can we can rebuild some of the infrastructure in a different way, quite different way. So that's my and to make it scalable. So that's my uh, first part. Now let me move down to the the relation between the digital currency and the payment. Now, I, I just want to uh, mention a bit of the pra practice in China. Now, in China, it is the, it's called the, a digital currency and electronic payment. So essentially, it separates the role of the central bank of the finance, uh, financial and the business sectors. So essentially, it's a two-tiered structure in China. And the role of the PBOC in, is the, the issuing of the currency and the clearance is centralized. Now uh, it does it does not rely on card schemes. Then it, on the second tier, then it it has institutions. Uh, now it includes the six largest state-owned banks. It has two internet banks, um, uh, and the the the, the uh, that that promotes the mobile payment. Then uh, then underneath that you have the merchants, corporations, and, and the consumers. Now, China has, at this point, it has, it has the experience, uh, tried to explore this in about uh, uh, several big cities. 
And right now, by the June 30th of this year, uh, it has about uh, more than 20 million consumers and uh, uh, 3.5 million uh, business opens the e uh, currency wallet. Now, uh, it the transaction is amounts to about five billion dollars. But of course, it's 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 still very trivial compared to the uh, uh, total mobile payment amount uh, of by the end of last year of the 64 trillion USD. And the volume of transaction is about 70 million, which is very little compared to the 123 billion and transactions. Now the key challenge as some of the things I think that Barry mentioned is that uh, on the merchant side, so what's the incentive of this? So on the merchant side, then because right now the, the transaction fee is of this is zero. So essentially the, the merchants uh, do not benefit much from this directly and say they probably do not have enough incentive to, to upgrade their, their uh, systems. And on the consumer side, essentially in China, the C2C payment, uh, the, uh, the bulk of that is actually free right now. It's so cheap. You, you, the the payment has gone through a revolution. So the, it's probably not enough in a, uh, incentive to, for, the, for, the, uh, for the consumers to adopt. So let me summarize. I'm going to stop here very soon. So I, I guess let's quote the seminal work by uh, Kota, uh, back in 1998, money is memory. Now we are in the age that money is, this memory is being digitized. So that uh, brings to uh, two kind of changes. One is that it has revolutionized how payment is done uh, by the private sector uh, and how it is, it's, it cost becomes so much lower and it has integrated much more with the real economy and spurs more business opportunities. This is great stuff. On the other hand, then it also brings the challenge to the relation between the central bank and the private sector, because now there's more uh, memory, that digitized memory can serve as money. Now, so how do you balance these two? I think it's the, it's the challenge and uh, it's complicated, but I guess my my key point here is that we need to balance the things and especially we can see a lot of the things can be done by the market and uh, as or, already happening. And we prob and also because it's so much more integrated with the real economic activities, we should probably should leave some room for the innovation. So let me stop here for now. Thank you very much, Long. Very interesting indeed. Uh, before giving the floor to Marius, let me remind our audience that in order to ask questions, you should use the chat function of, of web, the WebEx platform. Uh, Marius, you have the floor. Thank you, Fabio. Can you conf confirm that you can hear me fine? Very well. Fantastic. So, uh, very happy to be on this uh, panel and congratulations to Italy on its G20 initiatives and specifically on this particular one on cross-border payments. And I think this uh, conference is a really timely one. Uh, Professor uh, Green uh, said he will be provocative. I'll try to be provocative as well. Uh, but maybe on the other side, and we'll try to find the balance on this panel. And I'm sure that Fabio will do a good, good work on, on balancing the views. My first point is uh, that um, when we talk about currencies, uh, be it uh, domestic, uh, central bank issued, or privately issued, or cross-border elements of that, it all, all boils down to one particular issue, and I call it trust. Do I trust uh, the geopolitical arrangement that I live in? Do I trust the financial order where the financial intermediaries interact with each other in an international cross-border fashion? Uh, or do I, do I trust my financial institution that I deal with? Do I trust the instrument that I use in my daily activity? And that is uh, the issue that we are trying to address here today or when we talk about cross-border payments. Because when we talk about cross-border financial activity, all of a sudden it's not only one currency, sometimes it's a couple currencies. It's not one financial infrastructure that I have to rely on. It's several, maybe some intermediary one, cross-border uh, transactions uh, involve correspondent banking. Um, only now we can see that there is a move into you know, cutting out the intermediary 
and uh, maybe if uh, trials are successful, interlinking financial infrastructures. And I think it's all about trust again. Will I trust that infrastructure? And I think Professor Isengreen asked a very good question. What will be the legal underpinning, the governance of these new, new infrastructures where cross-border financial activities rely on? Because if they are not sound, if it's not based on a legal framework where I can challenge as a consumer, as a business, I will hesitate to use it. So that's my first point. My second point is, even though there are risks involved in uh, utilizing new technologies, and there are many, and we can have a separate uh, panel discussion on just focusing on risks, we should not oversee the benefits. And those benefits are in the fringe uh, use cases where the majority of the society might not even think about them. And let me point out one particular one, which is very relevant to the country where I live in, which is Lithuania. We have an issue, and that issue is a dictator living across the border, and he's sending refugees into Lithuania. And all of a sudden, we have to face an issue of onboarding people of various kinds, various backgrounds, different countries who have no documents. And uh, they need to be paid benefits. They need to be maybe receiving some funds from the relatives uh, from Syria or Afghanistan. And there's no way unless you financially include them in the financial system. And that is, again, an element of trust. Because just one year ago in the parliament, we had almost a fight where different political factions were discussing, should we allow a driver's license to be a good a document for a person to be identified. Now we're facing an issue where people have no documents and they need to be allowed into the financial system. Of course, there are various solutions for that. And I think G20 is also a good framework to discuss these issues. But this is just one particular use case where cross-border element comes into play. So all of a sudden, various solutions which rely on shared infrastructures, uh, shared identity schemes uh, come into play. And I think these are the benefits that we should focus when we are discussing on various use cases for currency. It's also about habits. Um, my colleague uh, from a uh, Chinese uh, institution uh, brought an issue of uh, QR code as a re really proliferant uh, uh, point of interaction uh, in uh, initiating and accepting payments in uh, Southeast Asia, including China. Uh, but a market participant tried that uh, in, uh, in Lithuania and failed because the habits of the consumers are so um, enshrined in using a card payment, uh, in using a contactless cards, that they fail to see that uh, there is also a possibility to utilize a QR code. And that was a complete failure of course, now, once we are in a pandemic regime and everyone has to show a QR code to enter a grocery store to show their vaccination certificate, now the habits are being formed again. So I would like to make my, my third point on this, that when we talk about the payment instruments, even in the cross-border uh, setup, we have to think about habits of how these instruments will be used at uh, point of interaction or in initiating or accepting payments. My third point is on uh, uh, making a, an argument that in our discussions, in academic discussions, in policy discussions, we are focusing on issues which are very important, but might not be at the center of the discussion in the public. If you ask an average Joe on the street, would he care if it is central bank issued currency or privately issued currency? First of all, he would not understand the question that you're asking him. Second, he would not understand the economics behind it because even if it's private, right? The, the majority, it's insured majority of that. And of course there's government, there's there are institutions and there's a legal framework. And why should I care? So then we are discussing about various um, modalities of how central bank 
digital or non-digital currency should be introduced, what type of uh, payments we would uh, introduce, we should also think, how do we convince the public that that is solving really some problem? And if we do not convince the public that that particular new technological innovation that we will be implementing will solve the problem, we'll have a very uh, bad outcome. Marius, you are frozen. Marius, you finished? Uh, I was uh, disconnected. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Finish. Sorry about, sorry about that. So my point was that if we do not deny, design CBDC in such a way where the public sees the benefits, it's not the case that we will uh, dr drain the liquidity of the commercial banking industry, but the opposite outcome might be also possible where the majority of the public will fail, will fail to see the benefits and will not use that instrument. So that is my argument where I would like to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. Uh, let me now turn to Fiona. Fiona, do you have questions from the audience at this stage? And indeed, we have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the, the first one to Benedict on the uh, CBDC uh, project uh, that you were mentioning before, Embridge. Uh, there is a question whether you have uh, any prospects for when the results of this project could be seen. Acknowledging, uh, of course, the, the person asking the question has acknowledged that this has not started very long ago. Actually, uh, we will be issuing a, a report uh, tomorrow, a progress report on, on this uh, specific infrastructure. Um, and we also, in that progress report, will set out uh, the next steps that we still need to, that we need to progress uh, further. And we had a, another question uh, where there was support for the stance taken by Barry. Um, about uh, challenging the, the status quo, and in particular uh, on the idea that the, the private sector has fin fintech technology and uh, could engage with partnerships, so banks and fintechs and fintech startups together to accelerate transformation. And uh, the, the participant was wondering about your views on that type of partnership. Yes, we see a lot of examples of that, and, and, and I think that uh, once again, kind of makes my point. There is a, a company Ripple a few miles from here in San Francisco that has partnered with a big uh, multinational bank to uh, do its uh, interbank cross-border payments at lower cost in less time. So uh, uh, again, I think we see a, a lot of partnerships and innovations in the private sector that are effectively accomplishing in terms of cost and speed what uh, interoperable CBDCs are intended to do. Uh, Fiona, we have other questions? That would be it at this point in time, Fabio. Okay, I, maybe I can uh, uh, ask a couple of questions. One too long. Um, I would like to, to you know, uh, benefit from the opportunity to have it, uh, you here long and ask you uh, information on the uh, ERNB that has been, uh, you know, it, which is being uh, experimented in, in uh, China. One, one uh, uh, key issue is uh, how to make uh, the issuance of a CBDC compatible with financial stability. And one uh, possible solution, which is often discussed, is limits impose limits on holdings or transactions or tiered remuneration. Do you have any limit on the use of CBDCs? And if yes, are they temporary or permanent? Then uh, if I can um, you know, not, 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 not ask a question, but do a comment on this very interesting exchange between Barry and Marcos, uh, Marius. So I, I think that the, you know, uh, Barry correctly uh, raised the, the doubt on whether we really need a CBDC to improve the functioning of wholesale financial markets that are wholesale uh, money markets, which are uh, 
now operated by highly efficient uh, private companies. Um, and uh, I think Marius correctly mentioned the issue of trust. Um, money is based on trust, and uh, I think it's fair to say that in order to guarantee trust, uh, central banks have a competitive advantage. This is certainly true for retail uh, CBDCs. Uh, maybe the, the, the story would be different for uh, wholesale markets uh, in which uh, transactions uh, uh, take place uh, among uh, professional uh, investors who know each other, who trade on a recurring basis and do trust each other. But also, and on this, I would like to ask you your, your view, uh, Barry, also in this market, um, you know, uh, market participants uh, do want to settle in central bank money. They do want to settle their trade with the safest asset in the economy, of course. And this requires a direct involvement of the central bank. Of course, the central bank would give access to its accounts to private um, um, uh, service providers, but then this could be seen as, uh, to some extent at least, outsourcing one of the core functions of central banks, the, the, you know, the creation of, of uh, money. So how would you see this, uh, this uh, comment, Barry? How would you consider this, uh, you know, this idea that uh, central, bank, central banks do have to be in the market even if some uh, highly efficient uh, uh, private service providers can uh, be uh, operating this market as well, uh, simply because you need an anchor and uh, uh, private market participants seem to uh, ask settlement in central bank money. Well, if, if you want me to go first, um, I view this from the point of view uh, uh, of the payment system. Uh, the payment system being in a, a central public utility. And uh, I, I, I think a lot of the interest in issuing CBDCs in, 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 in general uh, reflects worries on the part of central banks uh, around losing control of the payments system and uh, lost control translating in, in, into worries about s stability thereof. Um, so, uh, Long will, will correct me perhaps, but I think that's a large part of the motivation of, uh, of the People's Bank of China in moving in this direction. It doesn't obviously follow in my mind that you, you have to create and issue a CBDC in order to retain control of the payment system. So, Long will correct me again, but the Chinese authorities have retained control of the payment system without nationwide issuance of a CBDC by cracking down on Alipay and WeChat Pay, regulating the you-know-what out of them. So, uh, in large parts of, of Africa, payments are made using smartphones and uh, private uh, technology uh, M-Pesa run, run by national telecoms and the way the integrity of that system is maintained is that the telecom regulator working together with the financial regulator ensure that standards are being met. So, uh, I, 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 I think concern about the integrity and, and, and oversight of the payment system is valid, but it can be done in a variety of different ways that don't inevitably lead you toward a central bank digital currency. Thank you, Barry. Marius, you want to step in? Sure, thank you. On the first point on uh, kind of this um, difference between uh, wholesale and retail, uh, it might be the case that in a wholesale space, um, you know, the issue of finality of payment is much more important. And that's the reason uh, why, you know, the use of uh, uh, very strictly legally bound uh, intermediary, uh, you know, a payment system is necessary. Uh, because if I'm engaged in a, a securities trading or, or be it a money market uh, uh, tripartite repo activity, I need to know what will happen if things happen. And I need to know it with certainty and I need to know with all kind of the bells and whistles attached to that. On a, on a retail case, 
it might not be that involved and individuals rely on uh, various uh, safety net features uh, of uh, the financial system that we are engaged in. But uh, on your point on uh, should uh, we rely everything uh, or should we kind of rely on everything being done by the central bank, I would say that if we as regulators, as uh, financial infrastructure providers, as central banks, do not include uh, the new initiatives in the regulatory perimeter in a, such a way that they feel uh, that they have still space to breathe, innovations will take place outside of regulatory perimeter, which we have witnessed uh, already. So that is the, the, the thing that we have to avoid. And uh, the best judgment of that will be, of course, what the public, uh, be it wholesale or retail, will rely on. And in the whole space, uh, you know, you can ask a question, what, what, what's the reason why people in the particular countries are not using their own currency to trade in and are relying on a currency from a foreign country? Again, my first point on my previous remark, it's the issue of trust. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. We have one minute left. Uh, Long, do you want to add a comment or a couple of questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I think firstly, it makes a lot of sense for the central banks, uh, the monetary policies to be digitized. I mean, they have to be, uh, so to be smarter, and especially with a lot of other digitized memory coming up. So I think it makes, makes a lot of sense. The challenge here then is that uh, now actually, uh, let's say, particularly in China, that the payment is actually quite affordable right now. So I just mentioned that on the business side and also on the consumer side, essentially, so how do you incentivize them? So that's a challenge, but I think it's a lot of, make, makes a lot of sense for central banks to, to digitize monetary policy. So I think, but the way, the question is how do you can incentivize people? Now, uh, another point is that just follow up is the earlier so actually, this doesn't have to be a blockchain. Uh, it's just that actually uh, what central banks really want is a smarter currency in the digitized world to make the monetary policy much smarter, just like the other stuff. Uh, so, so I think it doesn't have to rely on the blockchain. Just a comment. And finally, it's on the limits of the use of this. Um, I have to be clear that I'm not exactly sure the 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 as much details but i guess it's at this stage it's more about promoting the use of this uh so because it's really how trying to promote the both on business business and the consumer side to use and so it's not uh it's not as much about the limits it's as much about it's more about the promotion stage so it's just several uh comments and finally i think it's the open banking stuff. I think that it makes a lot of sense because of the information revolution. I think it makes a lot of sense for the banks and fintechs to work with each other, as Barry mentioned. Uh, it's, and the central bank is really the fundamental is, it, layer. But then uh, we should, uh, this should work a lot because they have relative strengths, information strengths, uh, uh, functional strengths to, to serve the customers. I'll stop here. So the future is open finance. Thank you, Lord. thank you. So uh, if there are no other questions, uh, let me conclude uh, this panel by thanking the panelists for sharing their insights on the, the different topics that were raised in the discussion. Uh, de facto, we have concentrated on uh, CBDC, which is uh, uh, clearly uh, the topic of the day and uh, a number of open questions uh, have uh, emerged very uh, clearly. Uh, what we heard from uh, our panelists uh, has been uh, interesting, uh, inspiring and insightful for you. Uh, I uh, have certainly for one take, uh, taken uh, note of uh, a number of interesting uh, uh, comments, aspects that will continue to be brought forward by many of us, including us at the uh, European Central Bank in, in the Euro system, in our practical work on CBDC solutions. I started my uh, this session, my comments, by saying that uh, uh, 
uh, we are in exciting times. And let me conclude by thanking our panelists, uh, uh, Long, Barry, Marius, and Benedict, for reminding us exactly uh, why these are exciting times and uh, why the excitement, the excitement uh, will likely continue. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you. Many thanks uh, to Fabio for chairing this uh, session and also to all the panelists uh, for a uh, very informative and also provocative uh, at times uh, uh, panel. Um, we now move to the next uh, session, which will consist of two papers with two discussants. Uh, the session is entitled The Challenges of Digital Innovation and will be chaired uh, by uh, Rod Garrett. Um, and so, Rod, uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. So, we have uh, two papers in this session, and I will, uh, and two discussants for these papers. So, I'll go ahead and introduce the uh, first paper presenter and discussant, and then we'll have a, a short question period, and then I'll, then I'll introduce the next two speakers. So, so we start off with uh, Robert Townsend. Robert is the Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics at MIT. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Econometric Society, and he is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's made substantial contributions to several areas of economics with the common theme of combining theory and data to provide insights into economic systems and financial markets. His recent book, Distributed Ledgers, Design and Regulation of Financial Infrastructure and Payment Systems, provides an economic analysis of what can actually be accomplished using distributed ledgers in both developed and emerging market economies. So Professor Townsend will present his work, uh, Digital Payments and CBDC, Lessons from Economic Theory uh, and actual markets. And then here to discuss his work is uh, Harry Leinen, who is currently with uh, PSS Consultancy and is a former financial counselor at the Finnish Ministry of Finance and advisor to the board of the Bank of Finland. Mr. Leinen has been shaping our thinking about digital innovation and payments for over 20 years. I hope uh, that's okay to say. <laughs> uh, and I look forward to hearing his comments, but I'll, we'll go ahead uh, with uh, Robert, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, let me try to uh, share my screen here. Uh, can, can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate in these events. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have a little time for discussion, but also I am uh, eager to interact. So if that doesn't happen too much, we can uh, try to talk afterwards. Uh, so Rod's already given the title. Thank you for the gracious introduction. Digital Payments and CBDC Lessons from Economic Theory and Actual Markets. So there is a broad spectrum of monies, if you will, and I don't need to go through Rod's flower in too much detail, but we've got uh, fiat money at the top paper money and central bank reserves onto proposed uh, central bank digital currency or synthetic CBDCs, which are basically uh, stable coins up back to 100% by fiat money onto digital mobile money as the example of M-Pesa, which has already come up today, onto digital assets with potentially high velocity like Invenium uh, which is traded in secondary markets, and then finally with high velocity circulating private debt. So the basic idea of this little talk is to use economic theory to think about each one of these, or actually to be more precise, to identify problems that can arise in theory that also have arised and or will arise in practice and then go on to propose solutions to these problems using these new technologies of distributed ledgers, smart contracts, and encryption, and, and then place CBDC back into, uh, into this discussion. So I'm gonna do this via three examples. Since time is limited, I'm gonna focus on digital assets as circulating private debt on the US repo market and interdealer institutions uh, providing liquidity. So first, trade in digital assets, and the subtitle 
distributed ledgers can facilitate trade, yes, but they can create problems, which in turn can be solved with the new technologies as a regu regulatory tool. So if you think about high uh, velocity circulating private debt as traded in uh, segmented secondary markets, we know from the past, it may seem distant past, but still relevant, the crashes in London uh, in the market and bills of exchange. Um, in my view, this is likely to happen again as these digital assets uh, featuring atomic swaps uh, gain more and more traction. So the paper this is based on with Neil Wallace, again, has these secondary uh, markets um, uh, where traders, uh, traders can issue securities, uh, either the bills change, but nowadays with digital assets as a smart contract, uh, promising redemption at a specified date and location or market. Um, and the model allowed both short-term debt and long-term debts. The long-term debt circulate in these secondary markets where traders can buy and sell the acquired digital assets against goods, money, or indeed against other digital assets. Uh, the model doesn't allow people to renege on their debts, which you would might think is giving the problem uh, away, but actually it more features that even with that assumption, there are still problems that need to be solved. This is a, a baby example, if you will, with just uh, four traders and two uh, markets or locations. As you can see, trader one is always located in location one, trader four in location two, but traders three, two and three keep switching locations. So you can see quickly that in dates one and three, trader one and two are together, so they can issue these long-term two-period uh, debts, short-term debts, as it will, uh, and there are other, you know, pairings like that in this table. Uh, more interestingly are the kinds of uh, agent one in location one issuing a promise to pay in location one at date four, and that gets passed to agent two that in turn meets agent four in a different market who passes it back to three, and then three redeems the IOU uh, from trader one. So that's just one example. Two could issue this longer term circulating debt or for that matter, agents three or agents four. This little equation, which I won't attempt to go through in detail, has the fundamentals of the economy on the left-hand side and the right-hand side is, are various ways in terms of the issue of debt to achieve that fundamental. But there's a huge number of equilibria uh, in one, for example, all the circulating debt is issued in location one and another all in location two and indeed any linear combination works. But then the issue is how do the agents know what's going on in the other market? Um, so if this coordination problem is unresolved and agents guess wrong about what's going on in the other market, we get a financial crisis the price of the unnecessary or quote over issued debt collapses quickly as the uh, lack of coordination is revealed uh, and forward looking agents can mitigate this to some extent by reversing what would have been their short term debt issues. But the time profile uh, of those agents who are buying and then selling the circulating uh, digital asset um, uh, find that they're uh, position is, uh, cannot be smoothed, uh, as it would have been before, and they suffer large welfare losses. Now, how do we resolve the coordination problem? Uh, well, we have a multi-market smart contract on top. You could envision being implemented on a distributed ledger in which the digital assets are shared and then sequestered as in, uh, well, in Tanon and, uh, Lion Rock, for example, using hash time lock uh, specifications to achieve the coordination. And in the, in the baby example, you just need bounds on security issues and what doesn't happen in one market is filled in by the other in the initial date before anything happens. 
So that may all seem uh, either too distant, as in bills of exchange, or too abstract, as in theory not applied, but let me remind you about the next application, with, which is the U.S. repo market, where there arguably are coordination failures and restrictions limiting liquidity that have created a lot of volatility, which in turn can be solved by wholesale CBDC. So you're hopefully familiar with this picture in which we have security dealers in an inter-dealer market. These dealers have as clients either, say, money market funds who uh, are long on liquidity and would be happy to lend for treasuries or other collateral and then the repo. And we have, uh, for example, hedge funds on the other end who are eager to leverage up and borrow with the threat. So we see the flow of treasuries going one way and the flow of cash going the other with security dealers in the middle. Now the idea is those dealers have to decide whether or not to accept trades with their clients, who, as I said, are either supplying liquidity or treasuries, uh, depending on where they are in that schemata. Customers are subject to their own shocks. Broker dealers may try to deal with multiple clients and uh, balance their own order books. But if they don't balance, they have to carry the excess inventory or liquidities of liquidities or treasuries into the interdealer market. So then the broker dealers deal with among themselves in that market, um, uh, allowing the trades. But there is a cost if they guess wrong, there's a potential mismatch of quantities with, with dealers unable to pass along their inventory. And indeed, this is exactly the same coordination problem with multiple equilibria that I mentioned earlier. And likewise, if they don't coordinate correctly, um, and they are unlikely to unless they have all the information that they need in these segmented dealings, um, we're likely to get volatility, and I think arguably this is one reason we've seen the repo market in the U.S. suffering these uh, episodes. Relatedly, there's a lot of regulation on liquidity and leverage, which has also, some have argued, create shortages on the balance sheets. But with a smart contract and wholesale CBDC for the central bank reserves and a treasury ledger, one can keep the actual balance sheet items off of the um, balance sheets of the broker dealers because it will have been pre-contracted. Now, I don't have a lot of time, although I would love to do it, to go through the actual design in more detail. Um, I can come back to this slide later uh, in answer to questions, but it, it enumerates the steps uh, under which um, a CBDC uh, smart contract uh, with treasuries could operate in these New York markets. Finally, uh, the third example, dealers and liquidity, a hybrid borrowing and lending and insurance scheme done in the private sector, um, but with uh, ultimate transfers on the ledger. So this is M-PESA. As I said, referred to earlier, we have these little stick figures here who go to agents, say, depositing their Kenyan shillings in return for M-Pesa, e-credit, Safaricom books, uh, and then spending it on goods or sending it uh, back home to the villages who uh, go and cash it out. So there's a lot of cash in and cash out handled by these agents acting on behalf of Safaricom. In fact, this table shows the system doesn't work as well as you might have imagined. There are tons of shortages with these dealers in various proportions running out of the M-Pesa e-money or uh, running out of the Kenyan shillings. Because they're broker dealers, they have to be able to trade in both items and they're limited. Now, the way to solve this kind of, liqu this liquidity problem comes up in all kinds of contexts. Um, and the way to solve it um, is to think about the economic theory of it. So how do we mitigate liquidity shortages as idiosyncratic shocks? The answer is uh, ex-ante insurance contracts, yes, but be careful 
not to reveal too much information too quickly because that can damage uh, the ultimate uh, degree of volume of trades as has been documented in foreign exchange markets. Uh, so again, there's a little example here of two agents experiencing shocks in the first period and the second period and the shocks uh, are communicated as in uh, the revelation principle for contracts. But um, if this information leaked out uh, and B got a hold of it, then B would uh, do things that would limit the overall volume of trades. So the tricky thing here is to think about having a mechanism designer as a trusted third party, but in fact, uh, get rid of trusted, so-called trusted third parties uh, by having a pseudo contract, which is just code. So that's where the smart contract enters in. So. So in conclusion, I've gone through three examples, trade and digital assets where distributed ledgers and atomic swaps could cause a problem, but they're solved with the new technologies of the regulatory tool, the US repo market, um, where there are coordination failures and limited liquidity solved with a wholesale CBDC and uh, interdealer markets with liquidity problems solved with a hybrid borrowing and lending scheme, uh, completely preserving privacy and no trusted third uh, party uh, in the smart contract. So that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Th thanks, Robert. Your timing is, is wonderful. And so now we'll go ahead and move uh, to Harry Leinen, who can, who can give his discussion. Yeah, thank you, Rod. And Thank you, Robert, for an interesting uh, presentation. Now I would want to share my uh, slides, but I can't uh, do it yet, at least. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody, according to Finnish time. So the main points of, of Robert, I would say, is that CBDC could facilitate trading. Still, there could be liquidity and market coordination uh, problems, and broker dealers and other intermediaries would be needed. And this, I would say, is really based mostly on the market structure of today and the problem that we can see there. So I would uh, want to start by asking what is really a CBDC? What is a central bank digital currency? And my answer would be that it's really an RTDS system for retail users. We have been discussing very much of different kinds of technology and models. There can be many of those, and we will see in future how they look, but basically, it would mean that the, the central bank could have a million of customers, 100 millions of customer accounts where this uh, uh, currency will be usable for the customers. The customers, as others have said, they can use about several kind of payment systems. So there will be a competition and the central banks have to create a very easy to use interfaces for making these payments at merchants in e-commerce, person to person, so on, in order for the customers to be interested in. And I have perhaps seen too little of really how these user interfaces would look like in, in future. But the interesting thing is what will be the end effect of this kind of, of uh, real, real-time payments on, on retail level? How will they work and how much are they going to be used? So I would want to uh, cite here the Amaras law saying that we tend to overestimate the effects in the short run, but in the long run, we underestimate. And it will be interesting to see really what will happen with, with these developments. So I would say that these uh, real retail and wholesale RTGS payments that will imply a rather big change because we will have immediate payments then which means that we provide deliver and receive money 
all this immediately. And that will also mean that the settlement will become immediate in the future. So on the whole financial market, is it Forex, money market or securities training, everything will be settled directly. And simply that means that the sellers will get their money and the, uh, immediately and the buyers will get their assets immediately. And that's what we can see already in the uh, cryptocurrency exchanges of today. And this will apply a really big change to how the markets are working. So there will be different kind of consequences. One of the big ones is that there will be no long and short positions in the future. Because when you are in real, real time, everybody works out of their real time portfolios. They can buy with the money they have in the portfolio and they can sell those assets they have in the portfolio, but that's everything they can do. And if they uh, have a successful trade, the real time balances in their portfolio will be immediately updated. So they will be, you could say, accurate all the time and uh, they can be trading then the next second, the next split second even, but you deal always with something that is really in your portfolio. So in this time of environment, everybody is really accurate all the time uh, on the, in their portfolios. The next uh, big change that we will see is that there will not be really any liquidity problems because all the buyers need to present their money when they want to make a deal and all sellers have to present the necessary assets and the settlement agents can always therefore settle because they will have the possibility to use the central bank money or other money if we have private money there immediately and if you are going to borrow anything you have to do before the dealing, because otherwise you can't settle the, the, uh, the deal if you don't have the money on the table. So the participants will no, not have any positions to watch the other and neither to the system. So everyone has to be sure that they have the liquidity for the trading and the settle once more time is going to be really T plus zero now, just now, not T plus T or T plus three or something like that. It's di directly as a part of the deal itself. And then uh, there's a third big change that I can see. And that is really that everybody can be trading using the modern e-platforms in the same way as you do it uh, currently in, in different kind of virtual currency exchange systems. And that means that the uh, broker dealers, market makers, and also they will have, you could say, a smaller role in future and they can even disappear. Because that is what we can see in all e markets today, uh, electronic commerce is really based on, on uh, the producers and consumers directly interacting with them. So there will be less and less middlemen and the system will be much easier to handle. So do we have short and long term effects? For sure, we'll have both. The question is only when this will happen. And uh, I have difficulties, of course, to say exactly when they will happen. But I'm sure that this kind of future where, where we have the end investors directly on the market and everybody is working out the real time portfolios, which are accurate all the time, that is really the future. And that means that the market will become more stable than today. It will be very straightforward market and it is much more simpler both to oversee and to operate on. So I think that we can foresee something in the future, but I can't say when. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harry. Um, so Rob, can I offer you an opportunity to uh, respond uh, and, and then we'll uh, take some questions? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you so much for those comments. Uh, I actually agree with quite a lot of it. Um, 
I mean, at first, when you're talking about everyone being connected with everybody else, you know, you're we're moving towards the Aero Dubru, you know, general equilibrium setup. And although central bankers aren't maybe too pleased to hear it, uh, we don't need fiat money anymore in that world. Um, uh, I don't think we're there yet, but there are those tensions uh, present. However, when you went to the second part, you were saying uh, everyone will need liquidity in advance to settle trades. So you seem to be back to a, a world with money. And our experience with that is, uh, as in central bank settlement systems, uh, there's a, a great resistance to putting that much liquidity in advance before everything clears. So we get these algorithms and liquidity savings mechanisms and so on, which uh, in, in turn suffer from their own problems. The third part at the end, yes, uh, for two reasons. First of all, when I said broker dealers in the US repo market, that was a compromise because I think it's too radical at this point to propose getting rid of those dealers if we want to propose smart contract to be accepted. And there are relationships having to do with the second leg of the repo that are preserved the way I was describing it. But in general, these new technologies are designed, as the DeFi people would tell us, to eliminate the need for broker dealers and middlemen uh, and so on as, uh, as actors in the system. So I, I, uh, I, I definitely agree with that part too. Thank you. Great. Let's see. So, sorry, did you have, did you have something to add, Harry? Yeah, I could also agree that that we can see in the future more, you could say, DVD type of of uh, developments, so that the customers really will deal directly with assets to each other, and and that is what stable coins could also mean when they are based on on, for instance, different kind of of uh, commodity funds and things like that. But um, regarding uh, liquidity saving, that means always that you have to queue something because otherwise you can't really start to, to net anything. But that will not be needed in the future when customers would have a title to, uh, the end investors would have a title to central bank money because they can then pay. And of course, those that are selling something, they would want to have the money immediately. They don't want to wait for it. And, and uh, that is the big change that we will see here, that, that you can really use, you could say, immediate liquidity and receive immediate liquidity. And that will not increase the liquidity. You just will use more efficiently what's already there. Great. So, so Robert, I guess I'll I'll ask just one question. Uh, we we have time for that, and and maybe I'll give you a choice. So, so one would be, I'm trying to think specifically about how we think about this problem of coordination issues in financial markets and how uh, evolving technologies might help help deal with these. And so, one I would ask maybe just generally, if we think about this idea of of, of say programmable money. What what sense? What is the sense in which you can see that, or maybe just smart contracts more generally, uh, as as helping these coordination coordination issues, either in a general sense, or maybe if we wanted to, if you wanted to speak specifically about the the, the, the U.S. repo market problems of September two thousand nineteen. Yes, I, the point of the examples, several of them were that the smart contracting technology can solve the coordination problem. Uh, you could do that by sequestering the asset or liquidity in, in an escrow account uh, where the customer and, say, the dealer in the U.S. repo market agree, but the trade hasn't happened yet, likewise on both sides, and then the dealers get together and they, you know, have to communicate the commitments of their clients, which they can share with each other. By the way, all of it can be encrypted, so not too much information is getting leaked. And uh, and then, you know, sort of in this multilateral, you know, messaging scheme, uh, it's clear that the trade can go through. It's at that juncture, you know, that the coordination can happen uh, so that the one party or the other isn't 
the client's not handing over one thing or the other thing to the dealer only to find that the dealer gets caught short uh, or long carrying too much and so on. Um, the problem with the repo markets in Europe, uh, according to your former colleagues and my co-authors, Antoine Martin and so on, uh, seem to be more the issue of the distribution of liquidity rather than the amount of it. Uh, nevertheless, the Fed redoubled its effort to expand its portfolio yet again. Uh, not getting it quite right, they, they're, I think hit, they're hitting, you know, the nail with a very large hammer. And, and in my view, these new technologies, especially if you couple the data aspect that can be encrypted but used, would allow, you know, much more fine-tuned uh, liquidity injections. The, the example at the end with the interdealer market, I was featuring a sort of hybrid insurance scheme uh, to allow the liquidity to be better distributed um, in the market, but one could layer on top of that a central bank as a, as a separate player that could inject liquidity. And the models do show in some circumstances that that, that could be beneficial. So that's the programmed money part. Great. Well, thank you. So, uh, so our thanks to uh, Professor Townsend and Mr. Uh, Lannanen for for uh, wonderful talk and insightful comments. And so, let's now move on uh, to the next talk. So, uh, we have uh, Ulrich Binsile is the Director General of Market Infrastructure and Payments Division of the European Central Bank. Prior to his current role, he was Director General of Markets. I'll start with the obvious and say that he wrote what many consider to be the book on monetary policy implementation. He has also written extensively on a variety of topics, which most recently include CBDCs. So he's going to present his new work entitled CBDC making it not too successful through the choice of functional scope, pricing and controls. Uh, Dr. Vinsal's work will be discussed by uh, Francisca Carapella who is a principal economist at the Board of Governors at the Federal Reserve System. Francesca is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University. She has written extensively on transparency and collateral requirements in central clearing, liquidity and market structure, and the role of voluntary reserve requirements in a world with large excess reserves. This work makes her an excellent choice to comment on work related to limiting the scope of CBDC. So, uh, uh, um, I'll invite uh, Ulrich to go ahead and, and give his presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rod. Let me share the screen. I hope this works smoothly. I guess you can see it, yeah? So, yes. thanks. And this is a, a, a joint paper, actually, a not yet published, but a soon to be published paper together with uh, Fabio Panetta, whom you saw in the previous um, session and uh, Nacho Tirol, a colleague. And the title has uh, slightly changed relative to what you, Rod, uh, just mentioned, because we, let's say, wanted to soften it, make it a bit less provo provocative. So now it's just called Functional Scope Pricing and Controls. And uh, this is the overview of uh, the paper, the structure of it, and I will follow this also in my talk. So there are two sections which uh, go back to the store of value and the bank balance sheet disintermediation topic and the related mitigants. And that is uh, not completely new. Maybe it is just restated here with some uh, maybe smaller new points. But then where the paper is more innovative is on uh, section four and five. Four is on CBDC as means of exchange. So how to make it there successful and maybe not too successful. And then the international dimension. So I don't know if I need to present this slide, why CBDC? It was discussed uh, previously um, in, in this conference. So here in, in very short, the point is that when people move away from banknotes and we end in a world where banknotes would no longer be usable, we have ended in this world already in e-commerce, then there is an issue of the non-availability of central bank money for payments in the sense that this market is subject to network effects. Typically, few global private providers dominate it. There are therefore 
both potential competition and sovereignty concerns and the many central banks in this context conclude that it is desirable to maintain the choice of citizens to fall back on central bank money also in a fully digital age that may arise in the future and in this context also maintaining convertibility of commercial bank money into central bank money is a, a desirable feature that should be maintained so this is basically to um, maintain the central bank money as a meaningful anchor and not only a theoretical one in the monetary system and concretely on financial stability because the convertibility into central bank money of course uh, tests the liquidity of the private uh, sector in this field uh, on a constant basis so and in this context cross-border payments of course also will matter and will be uh, will play a more important role in my presentation even than in the paper itself so the issue which again has been discussed quite a bit is the one of an excessive store of value reliance on uh, cbdc um, and and here maybe one could say the central bank has a comparative advantage because it offers a risk-free store of value indeed more interesting and a bit more developed in this uh, presentation is a means of exchange dimension and i come to it um, some have uh, argued that maybe there's more of a risk that cbdc is not so successful as means of exchange because the private sector is in this business with uh, efficient uh, solutions and has been working on that for decades so some conclude from this observation that uh, cbdc may aim at uh, covering fields which are not in digital retail payments which are not yet covered sufficiently by the private sector which is here called a niche product um, and so it would basically go for what does not exist like offline um, retail payments or person-to-person -person payments maybe programmable retail payments or other functionality that so far um, let's say technology demand and supply conditions have not led to this being really deployed the store of value let me keep this uh, very short the the paper which is not uh, published you know restates uh, a bit the balance sheet mechanics and uh, you know shows again how uh, cbdc can contribute to structural or cyclical disintermediation of uh, banks and um, let me also recall that one can of course do this type of uh, flow of funds mechanics also in an international context um, like um, the, uh, illustrated here i will not go into detail on the right side where you have a two country case one being the issuer of a CBDC, of a global CBDC, the other country being only a user of that CBDC. What does it mean then for balance sheets, both in the issuing country and in the co-using country? Um, so obviously it has an international, also let's say the flow of funds, a balance sheet um, perspective has an international dimension. And that has also been Know, translated into macro models like uh, the two mentioned on this uh, slide and then the mitigants you know have been also discussed in the literature and the two basic uh, approaches are maybe holding limits and uh, tiered remuneration and uh, and here we can ask on both you know what what does it tell us or what how do those two approaches help us on the um, international dimension and of course on holding limits if you want um, to use holding limits for uh, foreign holders then either you put the limits to zero which is a quite uh, radical of course approach or you would have uh, to identify um, the foreign holders as well which is uh, less easy even than to identify for sure uh, for example, with e identity, the domestic users. 
So my intuition would be that on holding limits, um, if you apply hold, holding limits, you likely end up imposing a zero limit on foreigners. The alternative is tiered remuneration. And of course, in an ideal uh, world, I don't know ideal, but in a world where nominal interest rates would be higher than they are, for example, in the euro area, then maybe you would need actually neither limits nor a tiered remuneration if uh, you get uh, for a short-term risk-free investment uh, 4%, then um, the, the zero remuneration of CBDC is sufficient uh, deterrent to a large uh, scale store of value role, even in an international context. But that doesn't apply to the euro area where this type of assets are remunerated those days at minus 60 basis points. So what is the solution there? Uh, a tiering where domestic citizens would limitedly be allowed to hold uh, CBDC remunerated at 0%, but for large holdings of the same citizens or of holdings of, say, corporates and for holdings of foreigners, you could all apply an interest rate which ensures that this is not used as a store of value at a large uh, scale to limit uh, those uh, effects. And then, of course, um, this tiering approach has, uh, is somewhat more elegant than holding limits because calibrating holding limits again for foreigners and for corporates also is uh, very difficult uh, to imagine. Um, now let me turn to the means of payment dimension and this one is maybe more complex and has been uh, researched uh, less than the stock uh, store of value perspective and uh, yeah payments have strong network effects so steering CBDC usage as means of payment towards a good, a solid, but not excessive, whatever this means, success, is uh, less obvious. Um, in a certain way, in this field, the central bank has less comparative advantages uh, to the private sector. On the other side, the central bank wants its CBDC to be used as store of value, while it is more worried about an excessive, sorry, as a means of payment, while it is worried about an excessive uh, store of value. So, um, yeah, what um, what to do with that? Of course, you need to zoom at some stage then on the different use cases and ask yourself, for what payments do you want to be successful as uh, with your CBDC as means of payment? And uh, yeah, this just, uh, you know, is a list of different segments, person to person, physical point of interaction payments, e-commerce, recurrent payment and business to business payments. Uh, the paper then reflects, you know, on uh, those different uh, types and then also formulates some possible criteria to uh, guide a central bank in choosing how ambitious to be in those uh, respective markets. And th those are just possible, you know, points, possible perspectives. So you could say if banknotes were important, then I want CBDC to be important because it a bit, you know, replaces banknotes if people no longer want to use banknotes. Um, you could take the approach that you want it to be deployed in innovative areas. You could say uh, you want it to be in areas where you feel that strategic autonomy is threatened. You could say, I want it to be in areas where market power and market abuse is possible, or you want to have it maybe in areas where financial inclusion is uh, important. Um, you can also then ask yourself for every segment, what could be a usage ob objective for CBDC? Central banks have uh, never formulated usage objectives for uh, banknotes but uh, here you know we enter a market where um, central bank money becomes a closer substitute to existing private solutions so maybe we should think about do we have such an idea and if so how how does it look like and maybe the idea would be here in bold but just a tentative idea that probably you want you would like to prefer a situation where CBDC is used on a regular basis for a relatively small fraction 
of payments of a large part of the population rather than see it uh, dominating only a few segments of payments or only for few uh, people. Um, yeah, what are success factors then in, for example, POI payments? And uh, that has uh, three, three pillars, obviously. You need a merchant acceptance, you need um, an efficient distribution of CBDC to people via supervised intermediaries, and you want, of course, the end user to be keen to pay with CBDC. And I don't go into the details of the uh, issues that you know you have to address, you have to look at in each of those uh, three, let's say, important component of uh, of your success in POI payments to take maybe the largest uh, market for retail payments. Now let me move quickly to the international uh, dimension. Yes, CBDC has been mentioned to be important also in this respect, for example, in the G20 work on cross-border payments, there is one building block 19 advocating CBDC to enhance cross-border payments. And uh, here, I think there are even two building blocks. And uh, there's, you know, there was one report published which uh, outlines the idea of multiple CBDC platforms which will be interoperable. And um, also the digital euro report of the ECB talks about this. Um, and uh, and of course, then the question is, is that, you know, what to, what competition will we see there? Is it a zero sum game where different CBDCs will, you know, be in war with each other to gain a global market share? And of course, that should not be the case. It should be an orderly competition and it should not be a zero sum game, but have a value added on aggregate. And it, it is important to distinguish then against zooming uh, into the details to distinguish the different uh, use cases. And uh, I have some charts here. I go quickly through the charts. Uh, one case is um, uh, e-commerce, an international e-commerce transaction with FX conversion at the middle. And FX conversion at the middle means you need two CBDC accounts in this example on the euro side to be affected and two uh, accounts on the dollar side to be affected. And you need someone who does this FX conversion and ideally if you want it in real time, it must be based on a preset uh, binding quotes that market makers put into that system. Another case um, is just uh, the same, but there's no, let's say, current account uh, lag. Um, let's say there's no um, goods or service lag on the other side. Any remittance, for instance, uh, is otherwise similar to the previous case. Then you have the case of, uh, again, with uh, FX conversion of a traveler traveling from one uh, one CBDC area to, to the other. Again, you have FX conversion, could be quite similar, but you have the POI interoperability needed. Then you have cases without FX conversion. So you could have, uh, and that requires cross-border holdings, of course. So here you have basically a payment from Europe to America without FX conversion, implying that then the American party will hold digital euro. And uh, last but not least, you could imagine that CBDC is used truly internationally in transactions not even involving the country of issuance. Let me conclude. I see uh, Rod uh, wants to probably move on, but let me, I have one concluding slide that I wanted to show. Yes, maybe here for con concluding considerations. So uh, there's a time lag. Um, I try once more, sorry. So um, cross-border holdings should only be allowed on the basis of an international consensus and a set of rules and uh, need probably some safeguards. And all this has to be developed before cross-border usage uh, should be allowed. And uh, and one key issue will be also in cross-border usage, the same that affects uh, private cross-border payments, namely the uh, AMA CFD compliance issues will have to uh, be facilitated by a more systematic approach to that, uh, overcoming the fragmented implementation 
on private means of payments cross-border will be as important for CBDC and uh, it would be faced in the same way as it is now faced by the private sector. Then, uh, yeah, for small payments, one could say international card schemes do the job, but for small, small for big value payments, they are very expensive. And uh, last uh, but not least, yeah, a cross-border SEPA-like, so pay, uh, common payment area CBDC network with automatic currency conversion layer is a medium to long-term objective, which is fascinating, uh, but uh, maybe we cannot expect this to be deployed in the next uh, three, five years, but this is something which will require quite some, some more work and will be in a certain way the crowning of CBDC uh, work by different uh, countries, which could then build this network. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ulrich. I, di I didn't mean to, to rush you <laughs> by turning my camera back on. Uh, I was just taking some notes. Um, so let's move ahead to uh, the discussion by Francesca. Looks like I'm not a presenter yet. Uh, let me see if I can. Okay, now I am. So <laughs> let me share uh, the slides. Okay, so thanks, Rod, and uh, thanks uh, to the organizers uh, for inviting me to discuss this very nice paper. Uh, the views uh, that I will present are my own and uh, do not represent those of the Federal Reserve, um, uh, of course. Uh, let me jump uh, straight to the discussion. It's, this paper is full of nice ideas. My discussion is going to focus, however, on three of them. The first is the relationship between the function of money as a store of value and the function of money as medium of exchange. The second is the proposals uh, by the author of a tier remuneration scheme for a CBDC. And both of these ideas have the goal of preventing uh, runs on uh, banks and other financial institutions in the event of a lack of confidence in, in those institutions. The third is the international dimension and the goal uh, uh, there is to improve cross-border payments. Let me jump into the first one. The authors highlight how a CBDC should be not too good of a store of value to avoid bank disintermediation and bank runs, but should be a good medium of exchange so that the economy actually benefits from its introduction. However, the function of money as store of value and the function of money as medium of exchange are really intrinsically linked to each other. Let's think of fiat money uh, to fix ideas. That is an object with no intrinsic value, such as US banknotes, for example. So there, the store of value function stems from the means of payment function in the sense that fiat money has value tomorrow only because everyone expects to be able to spend it tomorrow. Everyone expects that fiat money will be accepted for payments tomorrow. A model where uh, fiat money or CBDC uh, is introduced and uh, where money hoarding takes place is a recent work in favor by Anil Fatu and the hoarding of CBDC or fiat money is inefficient in equilibrium and efficiency is restored by a, a probably designed tax on money hoarding. In spirit, the money hoarding tax in Alofata is very similar to the tiered remuneration uh, proposal that the authors advance. And I'll, I'll go back to that in a moment. But the bottom line is that with fiat money, the store of value function is intrinsically linked to the means of payment function. So let's move to commodity money instead. That is an object with intrinsic value, for example, like gold, or I would like you to think of treasuries. For commodity money, the store of value function stems not only from the ability to use it to make payments, I think of treasuries in the repo market, but also the store of value function stems from its cash flows. So different media of exchange can be ranked according not only to their liquidity properties, as say their ability to pay, but also according to their cash flows. The tier remuneration proposals that the authors advance is exactly affecting the second component, the cash flows. And so in some sense, I like to think of it as requiring to transform fiat money a little bit into commodity money. And it's very clever in doing so. So how does it do that? Well, 
holdings of CBDC above a certain threshold, so in the second tier, are remunerated as a less attractive rate than holdings of CBDC below the threshold, so in the first tier. This scheme is very similar, reminiscent of the voluntary reserve target framework for uh, monetary policy implementation, and I'm just going to call it a BRT uh, from now on. How does a BRT work? Well, the threshold for the first tier is chosen by each financial institution. And in a BRT, it's just called simply the target. Then shortages of holdings with respect to the target are charged a penalty rate, whereas holdings in excess of the target, above the target, are remunerated at a less attractive rate than those holdings up to the target. So if we were to uh, represent this remuneration schedule on a diagram, where on the x-axis we have either reserve holdings in a BRT for monetary policy implementation or CBDC holdings in this setting. And on the Y axis, the remuneration of those holdings, we can see that above this target, capital T, holdings are remunerated at a less attractive rate, RE, than holdings up to the target. Holdings up to the target are remunerated at an attractive rate, RT, but also effectively at the penalty rate because any extra holding of CBDC or reserves is foregoing the charge, the penalty charge. The only other difference between the VRT and the tier remuneration that the authors advance is that this um, uh, remuneration scheme does not start from the origin but below it, and that is because of the penalty rate. In a VRT, the penalty rate is necessary in order to induce banks to choose a finite target, a finite threshold. So now that I told you what is a BRT, why is that important in a CBDC setting? And I think it's important for three main reasons. The first one is that there would be no need for the central bank to figure out what is the, the threshold that is relevant for each financial institution, because each financial institution will voluntarily choose the relevant threshold, the target. The second reason, and related to the first one, is that the central bank can maintain control of money market rates regardless of the level of aggregate CBDC holdings in the economy. To understand why this happens, think for a moment of an economy where the threshold is chosen by the central bank. If that threshold is too large for a bank, then the rate at which that bank is willing to lend is the same rate as that on its first tier holdings of CBDC, because that it's the outside option of the bank. If the bank were not to lend, but to hold CBDC, it would earn the rate on the first tier. The opposite is true if the threshold is instead too small, then the rate at which an institution would land is the same as that on the second tier. And this would result in volatility in money market rates. In a VRT instead, any bank would always land at the same rate as that on its first tier holdings, at least in expectation. The reason is that every bank would choose the target so that it always meets it, at least in expectation. There's therefore resulting in lower volatility in money market rates. Finally, another advantage of a BRT, but it's important in this setting, is that the central bank can learn that funds are flowing into CBDC and possibly out of the financial system before they actually do so. And that is because financial institutions are going to adjust their targets or thresholds before they're actually going to move funds into CBDC holdings. And so the central bank can have this information and then react to that information according to how it sees fit. Lastly, in the international dimension, a, a BRT can also control uh, the cross-border flow of funds as uh, the authors highlight that their tier remuneration scheme would. However, there are some other big challenges in cross-border payments. And uh, some of them have been addressed or are being addressed, like uh, the um, uh, solution for outdated settlement technologies uh, that are not interoperable. And some proposed solutions have seen the entry into the market of fintech companies or um, platform that are interoperable, like the Nexus uh, proposed by uh, the BIS. However, there are other challenges that are not fixed yet, that do not see any uh, sort of solution yet. And the one that I see most uh, concerning is the cost of holding inventories, which is necessary for market makers to quote realistic foreign exchange rates. 
And there is no way around that unless one thinks of uh, central banks committing to reciprocal swap lines, uh, therefore not necessarily relying on inventories and, and so cutting the cost of holding inventories. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Great. So, uh, Alok, would you like to respond? Yes, sorry, I had difficulties to unmute. So thank you, thank you, Francesca. And um, I mean, the I'm I'm not sure. I mean, may, maybe we can take it uh, offline, but the voluntary character of the VAT, whether this uh, this helps here, because I mean, in the euro area at least, we have uh, five, six, I don't know how many trillion of uh, securities issued at a negative in, uh, with negative yields. So, and the stance of monetary policy is to, you know, to maintain this, to not undermine this. So, of course, if CBDC comes in a few years and and everything is different in terms of interest rate levels, then this doesn't apply. Um, and in the long term, that's what uh, what one hopes for. But uh, at the moment, that's reality. So, a voluntary, um, the voluntary nature, that's w what causes problems for me. If everybody can set voluntarily the let's say tier one remuneration then of course uh, you know everybody will set it very high i mean those people who hold the six, six trillion uh, euro securities with uh, with uh, negative yields will uh, will you know all want to put this into cbdc so that, that's why i don't um, understand yet the voluntary how the voluntary can work Sorry, just quickly, can I, Rod? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I just want to say, uh, that's a great point. I, I think, uh, so I guess two, two things I want to say. The first one is that I think, my understanding is that there are exemption uh, thresholds anyway, even on the negative interest rates. And one could easily uh, envisage the BRT uh, where the target is that, uh, that threshold, um, right? That exemption, uh, so that you think the first part is not uh, is not taxed, doesn't have a negative interest rate. Um, but the second is exactly the what I say. It's, it uh, it is exactly the, the reason why banks would not be choosing a zero or an infinite threshold or target um, is an outcome, and it's the result of a pricing scheme, right? So you have to devise prices uh, and penalty rate, and that's why I wanted to highlight the role of the penalty rate in the BRT. Uh, so that banks do so. So in the BRT, the penalty rate is essential because that prevents banks from pushing the target to infinity because that means that almost surely they will fail to admit it and they will be charged a penalty rate on any amount of shortages with respect to that target, right? So uh, uh, tying to um, uh, the mechanism design uh, uh, that um, uh, Bob Thompson has uh, so much worked on, that's part of a uh, mechanism design uh, problem. That's the solution of a mechanism design problem. But but I hear you. I think it just has to be solved. I, I didn't do that part. <laughs> okay, uh, great. So let's, so let's, I think we're, we have time for maybe one question because we started, we started about 10 minutes late. So maybe we can go a minute or two over. Um, so there is a question uh, uh, from uh, from Sachin Chada. Uh, how are the risks and domino effect of a failure of a participant's economy uh, slash systems impacting all other countries in a highly connected global system dealing with CBDCs? So so I've had longer to process that. Or so I so one way I think to interpret this is 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 uh, Francesca just brought up the idea of individual banks choosing their own. Uh, their own policies in order to, in some sense, limit possibly adverse effects of CBDCs. But if we also think about a sort of a global system, or do you want to comment on how individual countries might address this issue? Yeah, sure, uh, Rod. Um, so, I mean, generally, I would say it's a, a CBDC, which could be easily used uh, globally, will, you know, facilitate uh, uh, capital flows and, you know, will will uh, strengthen the international transmission and will then also potentially 
of course uh, create uh, bigger you know negative spillover effects of uh, problems in one country on others Th that's a general um, intuition of course here you know the the failure of a participant cbdc the nice thing with cbdc is it's um it's issued by someone who cannot fail in in its own currency i mean that's the whole you know financial stability advantage of central bank money so uh, i'm not sure what here the failure of another participant per se means um, in the context of let's say a heavily used cbdc unless you say you know the cbdc created much more you know global capital flows which somehow then have to be unwound in the crisis situation great thank you so uh well i'll give my thanks to each of the participants in this uh, session for what i think was a very interesting discussion great presentations um and i'll hand it back over to the to the organizers thank you rod and um, let me thank uh, governor visco managing director uh, Georgieva and the chairpersons uh, Fabio Panetta and Rod Garrett and of course uh, all uh, speakers, presenters, panelists and, and discussion, discussants uh, for a very lively and insightful uh, afternoon or morning or night, it depends. Um, let me just uh, uh, remind, well, we took of course uh, considerably more time that was envisaged in, in the program. Uh, but I mean, considerably a quarter of an hour, more or less, but I, I think it was very much worth it. And uh, let me just remind uh, everyone, we can close it here for, for today, but let me remind everyone that tomorrow at uh, 11, we start with day two and two panel discussions and again, a special session with papers and discussants. And thanks again, everyone for, for, for the very nice uh, uh, a conference, a webinar so far. Thank you.